afternoon. I'm Dr. Carol Henderson, Vice Provost for Diversity and Inclusion, Chief Diversity Officer and Advisor to the President. It is my pleasure to welcome you this afternoon to our Thought Leader Series. I have the honor and the privilege of engaging in conversation with Dr. Deborah Lipstadt, Dorot, Professor of Modern Jewish History and Holocaust Studies, and United States Special Envoy to Monitor and Combat Anti-Semitism. She is also a professor in TAM Institute for Jewish Studies, which of course she helped to found, and also in the Department of Religion. Dr. Lipstadt, it is an honor and a privilege to be here with you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Henderson. Um, one small correction, I'm nominated, I'm not yet the special envoy. Maybe by the time people watch this, I will be, but even just being nominated, it's a great privilege and it's a great pleasure to be here with you. Well deserved. Thank you. Yes, well, we're honored you're here. And so I wanna say congratulations on the nomination uh, as the special envoy to monitor and combat anti-Semitism. Tell me about this special honor, what the duties are that you'll have to carry out mm -hmm. in this role. Well, the, the position was created a number of years ago. It's been under a number of presidents. Uh, and uh, it was really created because members of Congress felt that there was a distinct rise in anti-Semitism worldwide. And uh, that anti-Semitism was so linked to world events and so linked, it was sort of like the canary in the coal mine. But the difference in, I'm the first person uh, about a year ago, Congress, a bipartisan, word you don't hear often enough, yes, yes. a bipartisan group of senators uh, uh, supported and overwhelmingly voted for elevating the position to a rank of ambassador. So I am, uh, uh, at time of filming, uh, pending Senate confirmation. Yes, and so. we, we hope that uh, moves swiftly in, which is why we have this moment, which uh, was a small window to be able to um, engage in this conversation as a gift to our campus community. So again, thank you. Let's talk about anti-Semitism. Well, first of all, I think you know, that's gonna sound very strange, but a lot of people aren't quite sure what anti-Semitism is. And in fact, when I had my hearing before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, I used the term, which I didn't even realize was distinctive, but a number of the reporters, uh, both domestically and internationally picked up that I used the term Jew hatred. Mm -hmm. Anti-Semitism is hating Jews because they're a Jew. Now you can hate a Jew because he's a terrible person or she's a terrible person, just like you can hate anyone, mm -hmm. you know, but it's hating them because they're a Jew. Mm -hmm. It has its roots. Not, not all historians agree with me, but many do. I would say it has its uh, roots um, in the New Testament story of the deicide, the death of Jesus, and um, which of course places the blame on the Jews, even though Jesus is a Jew too. Everyone is Jewish in the story except the Romans who actually killed him, but that's a historical fact. And the way in which that story was used in subsequent centuries, because when Christianity first started, and I'm, I'm way simplifying things, so when people on this campus who spend their whole life studying what I'm gonna say in about 90 seconds, right. um, and from whom I've learned a tremendous amount. Uh, but when Christianity first started, it was really a, a, a sect of Judaism. It was a portion, it was a, a aspect of Judaism or uh, a denomination. I don't know what, what term would be the exact right term. And then as it evolved and as it became the state religion of Rome, the, the feeling amongst church leaders was that we have to differentiate. So one of the things that was um, instituted, and we in fact have a professor on campus who's written, who many have written about this, but just recently wrote a book on this, what we call supersessionism. In other words, Christianity has come to supersede Judaism. So Judaism is an anachronism, and the people who adhere to Judaism are unenlightened, they're blinded, they're demonic, whatever, whatever term you might want to use, and the enlightened ones are the Christians. Now, having said all that, I don't want to suggest that anti-Semitism remains within the church. It doesn't. It it's ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. And when I say it's ubiquitous, 
Um, you can find anti-Semitism on the right. Oh, you can find, let me put it this way, I don't even want to say right or left. You can find it all the way across the political spectrum. You can find it amongst Christians, you can find it among Muslims, atheists, and even a handful of Jews. You can find it in Europe, South America. It, it just, it becomes a very convenient tool. And because it's so old, it sort of has its roots. Um, and it has caused quite, quite a lot of damage. No kidding. I mean, it is, you know, to think of something that has global currency uh, mm -hmm. in the ways in which it, it transcends borders um, and roots itself in behavior. But it has a different uh, characteristic, which sometimes makes it hard for people to fully grasp what it is. Now, um, just going back to the idea of pre every prejudice has a, a template of stereotypes. It does. Mm -hmm. And you can't take one element from the template and put it on the other. If, you're, if it's a uh, hatred or a prejudice towards Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, that's a different template than it would be uh, the template against uh, black people or Latino or uh, whatever. Each one, it, you, they're not movable. It's not movable pieces. It's not a chessboard. So the template of charges for anti-Semitism, I narrowed down to four, uh, speaking very broadly. Something to do with money, smart with money, rich, the assumption that all Jews are rich or whatever, you know, so, but something to do with money. Something to do with being smart, but in a malicious, manipulative way. Oh, those Jews, they're clever, crafty. Um, something to do with small in number, but able to wield um, great, great power, punching above their weight. Yes, a student asked a question about that. What is that punching up? Mm -hmm. Punch, and so that's the punching up, you mm -hmm. know, that, that the, the racist, let's just com contrast it with racism, because sure. those are so often done and misunderstood. The racist, by and large, looks at the person of color and says, if those people, big air quotes, move into our neighborhood, it's our neighborhood, you know, there goes the neighborhood, there goes the value, there go, they, their kids go to our kids, they go, to, because why? They're shiftless, they're lazy, they're all those words that we know are associated with the, the, the racist stereotype. So in other words, the racist punches, you gotta put, they're down, keep them down because they're going to, they're going to uh, bring us down, bring us down. The anti-Semite punches down, Jews are dirty, Jews spread disease, Jews are disgusting, but at the same time punches up. Jews are richer, Jews are smarter. Jews are engaged in a conspiracy against us. Anti-Semitism is, not just a prejudice, but it's also a conspiracy theory. They're, they're trying to hurt us. So it's not just that you loathe them as you might loathe the person who's beneath you, but you loathe them and you fear them. Mm -hmm. You fear them for what they might do to you. So um, it's that punching up and punching down which makes it different from other prejudices and presenting differently. And I think the, the last thing, because I'm sure we'll get to many other things in our conversation, the last thing that I think is important to understand is that Jews often don't present in the same way that other victims of prejudice present. They look powerful, they look well-established, they, you know, seem, if you ask somebody how many Jews in America, they'd say, oh, they're not that many, maybe 10, 15, 20 million, 6 million, 5 million, 6 million. Um, they, 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 seem, they seem to be all right. Mm -hmm. But uh, first of all, we know things can change on a dime. Well, they have. And they have. And you have people today who, look, we are, Emory is adjacent to a neighborhood with a lot of Jews in it and a lot of, uh, then an area with a number of churches and a number of synagogues. You drive by the churches, no police presence, doors are open, come in, welcome. You drive by any of the synagogues, especially when uh, their services or the children are there, or they're being picked up for school or dropped off or whatever it might be, and there's a police presence with the lights flashing. Um, because because of the of where we were, and I, I do know that those in our community, especially 
Christians, African Americans, after Charlottesville, we were on high alert. And I remember being in, because I was belonged to AME Church at that time, how the context changes. So it's hard to worship with fear. Well, and, Dylan Roof in, yes, in, in uh, Charleston, yes. uh, Mother yes. Emanuel Church. Yes, exactly. I was in right. Charleston a few years ago That's for right. the book festival. I made a point of mm -hmm. going there for services yes. early Sunday morning. Um, certainly AME Church. Yes. Yes, there's, there's that thing. But any Jewish institution, Jewish schools in, in Atlanta, in any place, any Jewish institution that doesn't have some form of security outside it, people say, what? What's going the on? kids are used to that. Mm. The kids are used to when you know, they come to the synagogue, they're used to saying thank you to the policeman, you know, for taking wow. care of us, whatever. Um, but they look across the street at the church and it's not there. So oftentimes anti-Semitism is very much aligned with the Holocaust. It has galvanized conversation campus-wide, campus -wide, but also nation. Right. right. We've just seen recent examples of that in the media, unfortunately, mm -hmm. and uh, with the suspension of Whoopi Goldberg uh, and other and uh, as some some of the students are asking why are politicians and we won't cover that but mm -hmm. thinking about why some folks can get away with saying some things and others don't and life is not fair yes and we know it's not so yeah. when we think about um, that the kind of the translational impact. I'm going to join that with another question about this revisionist history mm. um, yeah. and how that fuels hate, hatred and what we're experiencing right now globally about who controls the narrative. Right. Right. Uh, and uh, do you believe these behaviors are tenets of a different kind of violence? So to have my history erased where I can't talk about. You can't talk about, that's right. As you mentioned, there, there are two kinds of denial. Mm -hmm. There's hardcore denial, which says, oh, it didn't happen, the gas chambers were a myth. The people at Charlottesville in, the, in August uh, 2017 who were marching uh, to unite the right, ostensibly against the taking down of the statue of Robert E. Lee, but they really it was an attempt to unite the radical right white supremacist, anti-Semitic, white nationalist, right? Um, we, many of them said on camera, we don't believe there were gas chambers, Hitler, you did a great thing. That's hardcore denial of the facts. But there's also softcore denial. And it's something I think the, the um, African-American community certainly experienced. Oh, do we have to hear about slavery again? Oh, uh, enough of that. Why are you always going on about that? You know, it's, mm -hmm. so it's not denial of it happening, but denial of the importance of it. Now, at the same time, this is just to switch gears a little bit, I'm not suggesting that for Jews individually or collectively that their identity be built on hatred and discrimination. That. If you let your identity, if you let the discrimination you have faced and continue to face, irrespective of what group you're part of, but certainly I, I say this as a Jew, um, if you let that become the determining factor in your identity, then I always like, I, well, the way I phrase it is, you've ceded to the oppressor power over who you are. Wow. When they discriminate, I feel when they say anti-Semitic things, racist things, say, I feel strong as a whatever it might be. And they don't, I, no, do it despite, not because of. Yes, you have this wonderful quote, uh, and I wrote it, I love the letters you did with Abigail and Joe, for those mm -hmm. that haven't read um, anti-Semitism here and now, wonderful um, the ways in which that is it's a conversation um, with these individuals who are prototypes, she admits. Um, uh, Dr. Lipstadt admits, but there's this wonderful quote, two of them that I want to read that kind mm. of land, uh, uh, kind of added um, layer to what you just said. So one of the quotes was, my hope for my little friend is that as she grows up, this is in the last page right before your acknowledgement, which is powerful. My hope for my little friend is that as she grows up, her awareness of the dangers that may threaten her well-being at the synagogue or any other Jewish venue will never overshadow the joys she finds there. Mm -hmm. And the second quote, and this comes from the chapter about rejecting victimhood. Mm -hmm. um, 
Jewish tradition in all its manifestations, religious, secular, intellectual, communal, artistic, and so much more, is far too valuable to be tossed aside and replaced with a singular concentration on the fight against hatred. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I once, uh, first on the, the first quote about the little girl, um, who I'm going to, uh, who I read with now, she's 10, but I read with her every night. Um, we're now reading Michelle Obama's Becoming. Yes, um, amazing. That was when she was, oh, I don't know, she was, it, it's, it's actually two stories. The first time I was walking into the synagogue, she's a neighbor, so I was walking to the synagogue with her mother and her, and we walked into the synagogue, and there was a, having to be a police woman, police officer standing there on duty, and uh, her mother said, uh, say thank you to the police officer for taking care of us. And she looked utterly confused because for her, synagogue is her happy place. So here her mother is saying, thank the officer for taking care, for keeping us safe. Fast forward a couple of years, two years, three years maximum, and I think it was after, after um, Pittsburgh where 11 Jews were massacred mm. in a synagogue on Saturday yeah. morning yes. because it was refugee, because the service that weekend was dedicated to immigration and helping refugees. Um, and I was walking to the synagogue with her mother. She had met me, seen me walking. She came with me and said, waiting for her mother. And as we walked in, the police officer was there now wearing a bulletproof vest and even more armed than before. And uh, I was about, you know how you do a stage whisper to a little kid, say thank you, mm -hmm. as if the person were <laughs> here. And I was about to do that, thank you. And I didn't have to. She just turned to the policeman and said, thank you for taking care of us. Wow. And on one hand, I was very proud of her knowing to say thank you. But on the other hand, my heart broke into a yes. million pieces. Indeed. Because she knew she had to be taken care of at synagogue. Mm -hmm. Switching gears a bit here, tell me about, let's talk about anti-Semitism and higher education, which is a hot spot right That's now. That's very, it's Yes, a, let's talk about it. What are you seeing explicit? Mm -hmm. Implicit, mm -hmm. how can we distinguish the two? Yeah, you would think that the university would be the last place you would see it. Mm -hmm. Dedicated to equality, to inclusion, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But sadly, the university has become a place where there is a great deal of anti Semitism. And, uh, you know, as I said earlier, anti Semitism is ubiquitous, it comes from all across the political spectrum. Um, but it comes from the from the liberal end as well as the conservative end. The Charlottesville, Pittsburgh, uh, Poway, San Diego, Halle, Germany, so many places was the white nationalist, white supremacist. Because for the white nationalists, the white supremacists, the people in Charleston, Jews were not white. I mean, what were they chanting as they walked across the campus of the University of Virginia on Friday night before the rally on Saturday was Jews will not replace us. You know, and because their idea, and I'll, I'll get to the campus in a minute, their idea is that. And that that was done on a campus. So I think what was more startling about that was that that act happened, happened on, a, on a, a campus. And it paralyzed. Oh, I know students who were, who were hidden in their room, Jewish students who were hidden in their rooms. But uh, their idea of, it's called the Great Replacement Theory. And it started out as a far right wing, uh, sort of theory, but it's moved. You can hear it now on certain news channels, not all of them, but certain news channels in the United States uh, and in other countries as well. And what it essentially argues is that um, black people, brown people, Muslims are, are advancing, you know, and you see them coming into countries in large numbers, immigrating, et cetera, et cetera. In America, the ubiquitous south of the border kind of thing. And says the white supremacist, what racist, these people, they couldn't be achieving that on their own. They couldn't be pulling it. There has to be someone who's manipulating them, who's making them flood European countries, a million Muslims and people from Africa into, into Germany or wh wherever it might be. And there's got to be someone behind it. And there's got to be some, something going. It's a conspiracy theory. Um, Somewhat, this has got to be an effort to destroy white Christian culture and white Christian supremacy. But who could be these people? Remember, punches down. They're not smart enough, talented enough, organized enough to be able to do this on their own. There's got to be, they're the puppets. There's got to be a puppeteer 
Who's behind the scenes? Who's crafty enough to use others to further their own needs? Who might want to destroy white Christian culture? The Jews. So that's what the person on the far right says. On the left, it's, and this is what we see on campus, it's a little bit different. And I'm speaking in very broad and terms. Broad, right. Yeah, we want to make sure we right, know that. Right. We're Nazi, speaking broadly. Right. But it's enough there yes. that we can, we can mm -hmm. speak broadly without saying this is a small mm -hmm. There's a tendency or an approach to assessing power in the society and saying, um, or the, the, the view, the prism, you know, prism bends light, refracts light. Um, the view of power in a society is that prism has a number of facets, two of which are uh, class mm -hmm. and race. Mm -hmm. And to the person on the left, the Jew is falling into that anti-Semitic stereotype, all Jews are rich and Jew, all Jews are white, even though, you know, probably, I don't know, half the world Jewish population is, is from non-European, you know, Yemen, Iraq, North Africa, Ethiopia, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so if you're wealthy and if you're white, you can't be a victim of prejudice. It's, it's an oxymoronic. So if along comes the Jew and says, I'm a victim of prejudice. It's a different kind of prejudice, but it's a prejudice. Oh, they must be making this up. They must be doing it because they want sympathy they want to get in on our, you know, suffering or whatever it might be. And um, so Jews on campus very often feel like here they are, uh, maybe they themselves are not victims of anti-Semitism, but here we are, anti-Semitism is a real problem. And structurally, institutionally, no one is coming out to shoot them as happened in, in, in Pittsburgh. No one is coming out, you know, to say Jews will not replace us and terrorize them as happened in Charlottesville or in Poway or in so many other places. But they feel like I can't be part of this group because, you know, they say, oh, you're a Jew. You're not a victim of prejudice um, unless you denounce Israel, unless you, you know, say Jews are wrong or whatever it might be. So it's the kind of anti-Semitism that comes out of liberal, or so-called liberal, uh, progressive um, kinds of perspectives. And again, I'm not saying all, pers all in the, it's in the, and mm -hmm. nor it's just I'm saying everybody on the right is like, but when you go to those extremes. And Jewish students feel more and more dislocated. Uh, and of course, part of it, and we don't really have time to go into it in great depth, is of course the connection to Israel, mm -hmm. where uh, the, let me say this straight out. I said it my, at the Senate did. Foreign Relations Committee, but it bears repeating. Yes. Criticism of Israeli policies is not anti-Semitism. Like criticism of American policies is not anti-Americanism. And no uh, uh, logical person, however strong a supporter of Israel they may be, I would think would say that. If you, if you go to Israel, uh, the national sport, right behind soccer, or football, as they call it, um, or maybe even in front of it is criticism of the government. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, that's that's what's mm -hmm. going on. Mm -hmm. um, but when you question, when you immediately assume that Israel is, is is always in the wrong, when you question its right to exist, not to say that there aren't things wrong. Every country has things wrong, and there aren't things that institutionally needs to be changed, et cetera, et cetera. Um, or if you are, a, you can you're a Jew. Well, therefore, you first have to denounce this. And we've seen this on campuses. You have to denounce Israel, and then we'll let you be part of things. It's sort of it's it's McCarthyism in, in a, of the left, um, and it's it's a sort of calling for a loyal or a disloyalty test, and it becomes very very tricky, um, very tenuous very, even. And I'm going to ask you later about what guidance you give for us to have. Maybe we'll go into that question. What guidance? I mean, I know there's no there's no magic potion of how this goes. But if we're an institution that's about ideas and exchange, how do we have courageous conversations about intersectional, and this is what I, you know, intersectional identities as it pertains to Jewish identity, or the spectrum, there's a spectrum. Have well, you spoken you know, about? Again, um, 
anybody watching would see that. <laughs> yes, indeed, indeed. Uh, uh, black and white. Well, I, I'm, I don't consider, I can. I'm Jewish, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, but um, the tension between the two communities has become very, very deeply disturbing. Sometimes I think that um, certainly there are Jews who don't take racism. Lots of people don't take racism seriously. Don't. But I think also, and sometimes amongst some people in the African American community, again, some, some, um, there's a feeling that uh, you're encroaching on, on at, at long last, racism is getting serious consideration or more serious consideration than it got before in certain segments of society, particularly on the community, on the college campus. And here you come along and start talking about anti-Semitism. And the feeling is that there's only so much bandwidth of sympathy. And if there's so much for racism and you're coming in with anti-Semitism, it's going to be. And I argue the exact opposite. Agreed. I say that um, it may start with one group, but it never ends with the group. It often starts with anti-Semitism, but it moves right into racism. Or they're both there. Or it moves into Islamophobia, yeah. or all those. I mean, all. I mean, there's enough hatred, unfortunately, right. to go around. But that. maybe that's a good point on which to bring this all together. If you're going to be against hatred, you've got to be an equal opportunity hater of hatred. Even if your main concern is about one kind of hatred, you come from a certain group. You're going to care more about that group because it's your group, it's your people. You always care more about the family. You see if the family is safe, and then you see if the neighbors are safe. Uh, that's just human nature. That's how we're built. Um, but if you're really going to be concerned about hatred, you've got to be concerned about all kinds of hatred because the hater doesn't stop with one group. No, and that's, you know, it's it's a contagion in the worst kind of way. So I'm going to ask you a provocative question. I think I have two, but one is, what would you tell the younger you who is passionate about this work? Um, I think I read somewhere, I don't know if we wake up to study this kind of work. There's, there's something, there's usually an event mm -hmm. that becomes very transformative uh, and I always say the work finds us. I, I was very lucky. I grew up in a household with parents who came from very, very little. My father came to this country with a couple of dollars in his pocket. And his parents had died and he worked as a traveling salesman, eventually started a business. Not a, never a wealthy man, but raised children, all three graduate studies and made nice contributions to the, to the world and the society in which they lived. Um, and my mother came also from Worst of the Depression came to this country with her family from Canada. Um, but they firmly were firmly grounded in their Jewish identity, in their American identity, their gratitude to America for what it had given them. Um, but their willingness also to be critical and, and to believe in something. So I, I was very lucky in that sense. And then I had an amazing series of ex experiences, whether it was going to the Soviet Union in 1972 to visit Jews and being kicked out by the KGB and suddenly being afraid because of my Jewish identity, whether fast forward it was, you know, working on Holocaust denials, being sued for libel by the world's leading Holocaust denier. And I just want to say, if you have not seen the movie Denial, you have to see the movie Denial. Um, and the great support I got from Emory and so many others during that period. Um, and now with this nomination, um, I, I'm very lucky because I think there are many people, including in the 50 yards if you walk out of this building on this campus and, and beyond, who want to do something about hate, mm -hmm. who want to do something anti-Semitism, about rape, but they don't know what to do, whether, whatever hatred. And I been given an opportunity, not once, but a number of times, to stand up and confront the haters. And, um, uh, you know, it's been, it's been tremendously moving. Uh, when I was first asked to put my name forward for this position, I didn't think I would do it. You know, I, 
I love being here. I love my research. I love my life. I have a very nice life, and I am able to. And I love my students. Um, and a friend of me said, "Well, of course you're going to put your name forward." I said, well, "Why do you say that?" And she said, "Because you could make a difference." So I feel I've made a difference in some students' lives. I've made a difference in certain things. So if I can keep making a difference, I'm I'm blessed. Yes, I mean, I, I was speaking to one of your colleagues here, and I was telling them about the honor I was going to have the interview today. And she said, oh, my, she said, yes, uh, Deborah Lipstadt changed the world. Um, and it was such a powerful statement. Wow. That was what she said. And thinking of, you know, the comparison between trials and transformation and the ability that even though you went through that libel trial, that put the Holocaust and that experience, it embedded it in law in some ways to that it, it can't be erased. Put it front and center. Yes. Put it yes. front and center. Mm -hmm. and, um, That's civil and human rights, social it's justice. All, they're all, they're yeah. all connected. And um, my vocation and my avocation mesh. And how lucky I am. And how lucky the young woman is that you get to spend time with every day. I mean, <laughs> hopefully one day she'll see this conversation and think, wow, she was reading with me every she evening. She has doesn't have a clue. I mean, and, and you know, in some ways that's always beautiful when people don't have a clue because it, it keeps you grounded. In fact, she was a little annoyed when she heard the president nominate and said, you're going to move to Washington? Aww. I said, she said, I said, we can read over Zoom, she said. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to say thank you for spending time with me today. And this has been a gift. Um, what, and and I, I did share with you, I was going to ask you this question as the last question. What is your love letter to Emory, your pearls of wisdom, which of course you've given us many today uh, in doing this work? What do you want to leave with us? That however, whatever, in whatever capacity you're here, as a leading administrator of the campus, as a professor, as a student, as a, we say support staff, but there's so much more than that because they really make the, the, the place run. Um, you're part of an institution which um, I really feel is dedicated to making a difference. It's an institution with some black dark periods in its history. Um, we've been talking about anti-Semitism, the dental the school. The dental school, but which no longer exists. No longer, mm -hmm. but, but it was willing to look at that history and have the then president of the university to say to 500 people in a packed auditorium at the, stu at the Cox Center, uh, I am sorry, we are sorry. Yes. And for me, that closed the book. Yes. When you can say we did wrong and we're sorry, um, you have a chance here to really uh, have an impact. Use it. That's wonderful. Wonderful pearls of wisdom. I heard that earlier too about forgiveness. Once someone has asked for forgiveness, that's forgive it. Them. That's it. You 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 know, ask. That's the best thing you can do. I mean, I come from a tradition that's based on that. Our holiest day of the year, our central day of the year, is where you ask for forgiveness from God for the things you. But before you go there, you better make it right with your human beings because. Otherwise, it doesn't work. It does not so. work. Looking at uh, the student questions that were submitted, we answered a number of them, but we have one that is a direct question that we want to ask and get um, Dr. Lipstadt's um, pearls of wisdom on that. And the question is, what can students do to actively fight anti-Semitism on campus? Okay, I think first and foremost is not to run away from if you hear something, to paraphrase the TSA, those beloved people at the airport, uh, if you hear something, say something. Now you have to know what, you have to, what you're gonna say. Sometimes there's, there's anti-Semitism that comes with intention. There's all kinds, different forms of anti-Semitism. But sometimes anti-Semitism is clueless. And when I use clueless, I don't mean it in any amusing fashion. Mm -hmm. um, the person just doesn't realize what they're saying. Um, so engage, uh, engage with the person who's saying something. You'll find that most people on campus don't really understand what it is, don't quite understand 
well, I know racism is serious, and I know uh, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders are, are being beaten up. And, and it's a, But what are, what are the Jews complaining about, you know? Um, so to understand and to under, not to be embarrassed and not to be ashamed and be proud of who you are Jewishly. I think that's the first and foremost thing. But to know what to say to educate yourself, uh, to educate, to understand. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I wrote my book is a series of letters. Some people said to me, oh, you should have written a more scholarly book. I said, it's got 30 pages of footnotes in the back, so and notes. And it does. Uh, but I wanted to write a book that would read easily for students, for their parents, for, for all sorts of people. Um, because I think it's, it's a, a matter of engaging. So to be A, proud of who you are, B, educate others about anti-Semitism, but first educate yourself to understand truly what it is and how best to answer. I think that's a wonderful, it, it reminds me of a wonderful statement. I wrote this out. Uh, it's not on this card, but in your book, Anti-Semitism Here and Now, you, in your note to the reader, it's a wonderful note to the reader, and towards the end, you say something like you wrote the book with conviction because you realize that to begin the work, you have to have an understanding. That's right. And yeah. that is what this an understanding leads to action. Well, ultimately, whether it's here or with Senate confirmation, it's at the State Department, wherever it may be, uh, we're all educated. Yes, we are. And, and lucky to be so. And lucky and that we teach. And, and I know, just to add to this, it gets very exhausting being the person that has to educate when you are the the person that is being persecuted or harmed in that way. It can be exhausting, but it, that's where you gotta hold on to the positive. Yes, you gotta hold on to it. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, thank, thank you for having me. Fabulous. My this pleasure. Been, this has been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.